G'day, g'day. It's Nick here and welcome to Wicked Wildlife. And today we're up here in the top end of Australia, up south of Darwin. And I want to share with you guys a story about what's possibly the most famous ecological mistake ever made in Australia. And that is the introduction of the cane toad. So stick around, guys. They're pretty dangerous. Hey, So the story of the cane toad in Australia starts in the early 1930s at a time when 94% of Australia's sugar was grown on the east coast of northern Queensland. Now, unfortunately, during the 1930s, cane producers in Australia started suffering a lot of dieback from a native beetle called the greyback beetle. And basically, their little grubs, their little white wrigglers as babies, uh, loved to eat the roots underneath the sugar cane. So on top of it, it all looked fine. Underneath it would die off and the sugar cane would start browning off because it couldn't get any nutrients. And this became such a problem that the greyback beetle became known as the cane beetle or the cane grub. It was in 1932 when at a sugar conference in Puerto Rico in Central America where scientists boasted how successful the introduction of these toads had been in eradicating some sugar cane pests over there that they were subsequently introduced to other places such as Hawaii. It was in April of 1935 when an Australian sugar scientist, Reg Montgomery, was sent by the Sugar Experimental Board to go and collect 102 cane toads from Hawaii, bring them to his home where he bred them, and subsequently released their offspring in various places around North Queensland. Now, in Central America, these guys hadn't really been a pest. They're a natural part of the ecosystem over there, and everything from broad-snouted caimans to cat-eyed snakes to many of their local birds are really successful predators of cane toads. The problem is here in Australia, not only did they fail to control the cane grub or the greyback beetle, they had no other natural predators here in Australia at the time. And these guys spread across North Queensland really quickly. Now their success at spreading across the country was due to a couple of factors. The major one is of course the fact that these guys are highly toxic. These little glands behind their heads when squeezed or bitten emit a toxin that can kill almost any native Australian animal that tries to eat these guys. On top of the fact that they've got no predators, these guys breed really quickly. Most of our native frogs here in Australia, they only lay one to 2,000 eggs, and without a toxin to protect them, they have an incredibly high mortality. The cane toad, on the other hand, can lay up to 30,000 eggs, and they're toxic as eggs, so the fish can't eat them. They're toxic as tadpoles, and they're toxic as adults. In fact, there's only a short period where the tadpoles are turning into adult toads, where these little metamorphling toads don't have such a high level of toxin. So one point in their entire life cycle where they're actually at risk of predation from most of the animals here in Australia. So between the fact that they breed quickly and the fact that they've got no real predators here in Australia, these guys bred really quick. The other thing that helped these guys do so well in Australia is these guys are incredibly tough. They're just a durable toad. Their tadpoles can tolerate a certain amount of seawater that no other amphibian can really do. These guys are able to lose up to 25% of their body weight and moisture without dying. They can put up with conditions that most of our native amphibians just simply aren't designed to do. So these guys were natural born colonizers. The other thing that was unique about their situation here in Australia versus over in Central America is here they were placed in a position where they had unlimited habitat to move into that didn't already have cane toads. And what we sort of accidentally created was a situation that drove the evolution of certain cane toads. The toads that were at the invasion front were the ones that were able to move the furthest or the fastest. So they were bigger, they had longer legs. And because these toads were all in the area where living with each other, it created sort of like an Olympic village effect where the fittest are breeding with the fittest. And over time, these guys started to spread faster and faster and get bigger and bigger and have longer and longer legs. In fact, for the first few decades that these guys were in Australia, they were only expanding at about 10 kilometres a year. And in recent years, they started expanding at as much as 70 kilometres a year, just due to this natural selection that we've let them undergo here in Australia. Because of this rapid expansion of their range here in Australia, it only took until 1978 for these guys to reach New South Wales considering they'd been released all the way up in central and north Queensland. 1984, they'd reached here in the Northern Territory. 
and in 2009, they'd crossed the border into Western Australia. So they're now found in four different states of Australia, and they're not slowing down. Perhaps the biggest disaster and the most famous issue with these cane toads, though, is the massive impact that they have on native Australian animals. Now, a lot of people are actually surprised to know that there has not been a single extinction from the cane toad yet, but there's been some species come pretty close. The northern quoll, one of our native sort of marsupial cats, has been really decimated by cane toads. And the Mitchell's water monitor was recently placed on the critically endangered species list, with cane toads being listed as their most major threat. So the large predators that are feeding upon these guys are definitely being hit pretty hard. So when you hear all these facts, it's pretty easy to start thinking it's all doom and gloom and there is no coming back from here. And it sort of raises the question, what should we do? Now, over the last few decades, Australians have taken to an anti-toad crusade with absolute zeal. Whether it's things like toad busting, which is the individual going around and collecting and, and destroying toads. There's been some wonderful and bizarre and innovative designs for cane toad traps involving uh, different attractants from the sounds of toads to different foods, different light that attracts insects, all sorts of things. And in the Northern Territory here, they even tried cane toad exclusion fencing. So we've tried a fair few different things. Unfortunately, none of them has really worked so far. You see, to get rid of toads entirely, we're going to need something broader scale. And people have been thinking of this too. We've looked into things like viruses that we might be able to release, or genetically creating toads that only have male offspring so that over generations they die out. One scientist in the 1990s even talked about genetically engineering the northern quoll, which is one species currently decimated by cane toads, by inserting a cane toad gene which gives them tolerance to cane toad toxins which would let northern quolls then feed on cane toads. So from fences to toad busting to viruses to genetically engineered quolls, we've thought about it all and we still have 1.5 billion toads here in Australia. Interesting, lately, there's some research coming out saying that the threat of cane toads to our wildlife might not be as severe as we first thought. It's true that when cane toads move into an area at first, up to 95% of some predators like monitor lizards disappear. They die from eating cane toads. Anything that tries these guys or doesn't have an immunity is gone. But it's all not all doom and gloom. A lot of our native birds here in Australia, a lot of our rodents, uh, have a natural immunity to these guys because they also are found out in Southeast Asia where cane toads don't come from, but other species of Asiatic toads with the same toxins do live. So some of our birds and, uh, birds and rodents have a natural tolerance. On top of that, a couple of our snakes, like the keelback snake, which again has Asian ancestry, is able to dine on toads. Given time, we've also realised that some of the animals without a tolerance have adapted. In North Queensland, where these guys were first introduced, certain black snakes have grown bigger bodies and smaller heads. Other animals, like death adders and monitor lizards and northern quolls, have uh, learnt to avoid these guys, and populations are now made up of individuals, genetically, not inclined to eat toads. It's not to say that cane toads aren't immensely damaging, but where they are the most damaging is at the invasion front where it's the biggest toads arriving at first. They're just able to travel further and faster. And this has actually given rise to a really bizarre and possibly groundbreaking way of reducing the damage from cane toads. And that is to maybe release more cane toads. I know it sounds crazy. And if you say it to anybody in Australia, they'll think you're mad. But Professor Rick Shine, who is probably the world leading expert on cane toads here in Australia, has basically figured out that the smaller toads that don't come until after the invasion front are often non-lethal to some animals. And the problem is the animals never get a chance to meet these non-lethal toads because the big toads get through first. So if we find areas where it's inevitably going to happen, toads are going to arrive whether we like it or not, maybe it's better we release some of these baby toads, like training toads, into these areas to give the animals a fighting chance. They eat the baby toad, they get sick, they go, oh, I'm not going to do that again. And hopefully when the big toads arrive in the few months following, We've encouraged an entire generation of animals not to touch these guys. And it's worked in captivity. Rick Shine's uh, facility in captivity has trained northern quolls and uh, yellow-spotted monitors to avoid eating cane toads by feeding them non-lethal doses. After that, when they're exposed to them in the wild, those individuals deliberately avoided cane toads in the future. 
So at the end of the day, it's pretty obvious that the cane toad introduction has been a disaster in Australia. Whether or not there's been an extinction yet, they didn't do the original job. Uh, it wasn't until 30, 40 years later that farmers found a chemical to get rid of the greyback beetle. So the cane toad didn't do that. They also might not have driven anybody to extinction, but they have pushed a lot of species to the brink. Pygmy freshwater crocodiles, northern quolls, local populations of king brown snakes and black snakes, all because of this guy. However, we sort of make him a little bit of the scapegoat. And as we've said, he hasn't caused an extinction thus far, and nature has an amazing ability to adapt and survive. The problem is, can it do that when we're putting all these additional pressures? Habitat loss, global warming, climate change, other invasive species. So at the end of the day, if you're one of those people who's wanting to get rid of every toad in the country because it's gonna save the wildlife, but you still let your cat out at night to eat birds and possums, it's kind of hypocritical. He's certainly an environmental disaster. We need to keep looking into what we could do to get rid of him, but he's only one element in all the threats that our animals face here in Australia. So we can't take the blame for all of it. Anyway, guys, as always, I hope you found that interesting. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or like us on Facebook. And if you want to help us travel around even more and visit even more strange animals, please check us out on Patreon where your contribution can help our videos get further afield and better and better every week. Other than that, guys, as always, please be nice to wildlife, even the, uh, the not so nice wildlife. Have a good one and take care. See you next week.